All right, welcome. Welcome everybody to Nanotectonica 2024 uh, Design Research Seminar. So the purpose of this session today is for you to get an overview about this seminar, um, actually understand what this is all about. It is a beautiful elective, beautiful because it gives us the opportunity to conduct real design research without many constraints, that is, unlike your other design classes, um, there isn't given to you a proper architectural brief, aside a program, etc. And also unlike the lecture classes and the theory classes, it's also not a purely theoretical class, but it definitely has uh, a design production element to it. Uh, in fact, these are the two main trajectories um, of the class. If you look at the syllabus, which we'll be doing together in a minute, you'll see that it distinguishes between uh, historical grounds and research production. So there's a little bit of a theoretical element and there's a little bit of a practical element when it comes to design production. I hope you all appreciate this. I see a couple or a few familiar faces. One, two, three, four, with online, um, I guess you could call it um, repeat clients. Um, third time, second time. Have you been in my class before? You look so familiar. I've been probably on plenty of your reviews or something. Uh, second time, and Celine also second time. So. Well, that's your own fault if you choose to do that. There, there will be not, not really content repetition so much, but methodological uh, similarities to the classes you might have taken, which were either in this case, the third semester urban housing material context studio or the brand new seminar that we just concluded this uh, past fall, what is design? In fact, the class, What is Design, that I co-teach with Gorkan Kodalak, and it's, uh, it's been an absolutely wonderful experience, also learning experience for myself, has actually emerged out of this very seminar. So Nanotectonica, I started um, a long time ago. I was just take a stab at it. Let's say 15 years. It might be 18 years. I'm not sure. Um, as a completely open design research seminar that was to um, give students the opportunity to go deeper into um, aspects at the cross section between design technology, design education as in design methodology, as well as theory. So this uh, the theory part has become more and more prominent so that um, it really asked for um, a spin-off, and that's really what uh, what is design um, came out of. And Gorkan and I had a, a really super, super intense and interesting semester, and it was on all ends. It was a very delightful experience, as we find and read the comments also for the students. So we're going to repeat that in the fall now, always, and in the spring you have the classic nanotectonica. Um, the um, original version, if you will, of that seminar. Um, I have, if you could be so kind and um, just keep your video camera switched on, even if you are in the room and I can see you, just so that Celine can see you as well, um, because she will only see my face otherwise, because we don't have a room camera. And um, so if you could just switch on your, your cameras, that would be great. So right now I see Celine and myself, and I would like to see all of you on here. Um, so if you could be so kind and just use that spreadsheet and plug in the attendance, um, obviously you already have the um, Zoom link, so that's fantastic. I want to um, go through a few slides, but maybe we should do the, the standard introduction first, um, meaning uh, I, I introduce myself in brief, and then you, um, each of you introduce yourselves. I know half of you, um, I don't know if you all know each other yet, but let's give this a moment to get to know each other a little bit. 
um, very quickly, I think to make this productive, you can share whatever you want about your personal life, uh, where you live, where you went to school before. You may, if you want, share something about um, what was particularly interesting for you so far in your studies here at Pratt and what you're expecting from, I think it's your final semester. Let me see a show of hands. How many of you are in the final semester of the MR program? Everyone, is there anybody who's not? Okay, great. So this is indeed your final semester. You know what this program is all about. And um, if you could include in your uh, introduction just at least one thing, everybody, that is, what are you interested in? What you want to get out of the class, okay? Um, so let me start with myself, and then I just go through the roster. So... Um, Right now, everybody's clicked on. That means that everybody's here. Is that true? Are there like 11 people, 10 in the room, two, four, six, eight, ten? 10? Yeah, correct, super. And Celine online, I think we're supposed to be 11. That's wonderful. Um, so here, yeah, this is my official uh, page for um, the, the, the Pratt Institute uh, faculty bio. And I'm not gonna read through any of this, but just sort of say that if you are looking for some of the primary uh, links and references, you can even find that there. There's a button called Nanotectonica on this page. If you punch in my name at Pratt, you'll see this bio. And from there, you can click on uh, the button Nanotectonica, and that will give you a, a brief introduction of the seminar. So to myself, real quick, my name is Jonas Kersmeier or Jonas Kersmeier, if you like. Um, I'm a German architect, meaning I'm registered in Berlin, Germany, and I received a diploma in junior professional degree from University of Darmstadt. I also studied at MIT and did a post-professional uh, at Columbia University. I've been teaching at Pratt for um, nearly 20 years now. I also teach at University of Pennsylvania and I run a boutique architecture firm with my partner, Gisela Baumann, who you might know because she's also a colleague here at the GAUD. Um, I have a child, a son, who is now in college, um, almost as old as you guys, a little younger, and uh, a dog. And um, I live in Park Slope, Brooklyn. And um, despite the freezing cold weather, um, I'm still a huge fan of New York City, always been, always will be, and so glad to see you all. So why don't we go around the room this way? Um, Georgios, so good to see you back, man. How are you doing? Good, good, good. Happy New Year. Um, yeah, my name is Georgios. Georgios. Um, I'm from North Connecticut, uh, first generation Greek American. Um, I did my undergraduate in architecture at Rogers University, got a bachelor's here last semester, getting a master's and what um, much more said. So there's things to say there. So what one what do you want from nanotectonica this spring? I have the freedom to explore and research, I guess, my own kind of you know, it's like a yeah, freedom into a, a specific research topic or yeah. material or you know. Well, Georgios was one of the the inaugural students of uh, what is designed. Did a fantastic job on bismuth and a little bit on uh, Simon Don's theory of uh, individuation, which is in fact also something that you could continue here. I'm not suggesting one way or the other, but there will be a lot of overlaps where uh, we were very heavy on the philosophical end in one seminar, we we're more on the uh, practical end of design production, this one perhaps. So anyway, welcome back. It's good to see you. Um, Emily, hi, how are you? Oh. Uh, 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 
<laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, so yeah, did my undergrad at U University of Toronto, and then did an did an that's okay. Uh, bachelor's at University uh, Dalhousie in Halifax in environmental design, and then moved here. Um, a lot of my like focus throughout the program here has been kind of in the space of like advanced fabrication, uh, using robots specifically. Like last semester, I did a independent study on. 3D printing with compost and adding that as a material that we could create kind of ecologically active structures from. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I'm interested in like biomaterials, advanced fabrication. And then I guess in the like sphere of this course, I've been doing a lot of reading on like post-humanism thought mm -hmm. and like how that spans into like, like ecological thinking of, um, developing kind of architectural materiality. Um, so I was looking at a project that one of your students did before where they did like these kind of like masks and prosthetics. Yeah. Um, so I'm really interested in, yeah, exploring like post-human kind of prosthetic design because I have a, my brother is actually disabled. So I think it'd be cool to explore does he have disability any through like a, devices that he works with? Or? Uh, not right now. He probably will in the future have to have a prosthetic, but yeah. Well, you are in the right place. Yeah. Um, generally, fabrication, specifically robotics, very much on the agenda. If you like to have it on the agenda, and posthumanism certainly too is one of the directions in the theoretical track of the seminar. And it's not a technical seminar. I'm just using your sort of interest to throw in a couple of uh, aspects of the seminar. It's not in its own of itself a technical seminar, meaning I'm not teaching you software, mm -hmm. even though I like doing that, but it would probably expand the scope of the class. Um, but I can direct you in the right places to find support. Uh, in the studio, I'm working with Ezio Blasetti, who's um, really very, very savvy in these things, and we've been working together on it for many years. Yeah, I went to his review last semester. Pardon me? I went to his review last semester for the weaving. Yeah. Um, sat in on that. Yeah. That was, yeah. Yeah, he's also teaching a parallel robotics class here uh, on Fridays. But in any event, um, while this is not a tech, technical seminar for software applications or anything, you're very well supported if you really need support for you know, yeah. the technical stuff and robotics and so on. So. Excellent. Welcome, Emily. Thanks. Um, hi, I'm Denise. Um, I'm sorry, what was your name? Denise. 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 Okay. Yeah. Um, I did my undergrad in Turkey in architecture. Um, last semester I did a project that kind of focused on like bioconcrete and that that has like surface morphology and roughness that kind of promotes like microorganism growth. So I thought that maybe this class could, I don't know, give me a more like advanced um, perspective on kind of designing like more intricate like surface textures. Was it was in studio. Yeah. Yeah, it fits in the studio. So yeah. Um, I he, it was his first time. He, he was like Turkish. It was his first time giving Studio yeah. at Pratt. It was the Leisure Institute studio. So yeah. Yeah, yeah, I thought. What is a living structure and what's not is a very fundamental one actually to our discussion. So you know, that, if you're interested in that, you know, curious about the relationship between architecture, let's say, and growing garden based structures is a really interesting topic yeah. here as well. Great. Welcome, Denise. Thank you. I'm Matt. I'm from Minnesota. I did my undergrad at uh, North Dakota State University. And I guess my studies have kind of been like focused on like using like the use of biomaterials, but then like almost trying to incorporate vegetation into architecture not just like sticking on a wall or something but more like incorporating within the structure itself to like 
the inhabitable spaces um, within the structure. Oh, great. So that maybe there's an overlap with what Denise was describing as her interest. And that definitely is something that I'd love to explore with you. Um, let me just throw this out right away. We're all very familiar with AI, artificial intelligence, and it's been occupying our discourse for a number of years now. And we take neither a technophilia or nor a technophobia approach to any of this. And we embrace any kind of new technologies, um, discuss them very critically, make sure that you're on your way of understanding the fundamentals. So when you are moving out there, either as a professional or academic or both, that you are uh, well equipped to enter into a critical discussion and also uh, collaboration with these tools. Um, so AI has actually traditionally been understood as a more hierarchical understanding of inducing intelligence into the machine because it is fundamentally modeled after the human intelligence. Right? So the idea of AI is actually to, in some way, approach a human-like sort of intelligence versus AL, artificial life. Compare the two for a second, AI on one side, AL on the other side is an approach that does not, in a directed way, uh, try to achieve machine intelligence, but rather uh, aims at creating a living organism that, through its own evolution, will eventually develop form of intelligence. So there are or have been uh, two approaches to the synthetic life idea. And uh, the word AI is currently more prominent, but I think it's very interesting for you guys that are interested in that topic to also compare and relate that to the idea of AL, artificial life, which has been um, very high up on the agenda about 40 years ago um, through an author called Christopher, Long Christopher Longton. Um, his ideas have um, been really very instrumental in understanding the fundamentals of the Turing machine and algorithmic systems, especially um, if you're interested, like architects are, in their uh, phenotypical expression of space and even just geometry. Um, so his theoretical resources are really very important. The, the term that he coined artificial life is not as um, prominent right now, but again, I think very valuable to um, be informed by and to be able to compare to artificial intelligence. Um, welcome, Matt. I am Great. So what is it specifically that you're interested in already? That might change, but I like, okay. Yeah, <laughs> Welcome back, Sophie. Hi. Studio art. So while I've been at Braddock, like I've been trying to kind of find those in some way in most of my projects, I guess research. So I thought that this would be a great um, sort of capstone, I guess, to do that, continuing that, you know, exploring those lines and looking at nature versus um, 
you know, natural system versus artificial and what mm-hmm. does that even mean? Um, and like, how can you, I'm always interested in like the pointing out the differences or hiding them. Yeah. Um, how you can kind of draw more attention to both. Yeah, you all bring up really super interesting topics, uh, Ro and you too. I think that question, uh, certainly the question of nature and the concepts of nature that we have and that changing concept is a, a, a really interesting uh, conversation that we're having. But also what you mentioned in terms of environment, what is environment? Um, there's a German word Umwelt, which is also a technical philosophical term that you can relate to it. So in any form or fashion that you want to look into those terms also in a conceptual way that be uh, just wonderful welcome rowan hi, hi i'm Marina. i'm from greece uh, i studied the course in greece and my bachelor's my first master's degree on uh, fine arts sculpture and i think i'm really interested in exploring like different uh like not different but more open uh, ideas and more conceptual ideas and marina right yep. welcome marina um yeah i mean this together with um rowan's comment about uh, capstone or something like that the combination perhaps of your your journey here at pratt and arc um, since we don't have a proper thesis in this program, I, I would think that the combination of a class like this, this one in particular, with your semester six studio of experiments is actually something like a thesis in my mind. Uh, you are more than welcome to take cues from your design studio. I don't know if anybody's in my studio. Do you actually know if the semester six rosters out? It's not. But there's a chance that somebody here is in my class. Um, whether or not you are in my class, it doesn't matter in any studio, you could have a synergy between your work on the experiments in studio and your work on the design research in the seminar. So, you know, just embrace any kind of synergy that you see. It doesn't have to be, it's certainly not forced as a relation, it could be completely separate and never be any uh, uh, commonality between your investigation there or here. But if you like that, um, it's certainly welcome. Hi. Hi. My name is Anna. I'm from Texas. I'm my undergrad major level of architecture, and I work as an architect in Chicago for one year. Mm-hmm. And uh, I'm an advanced master's student, so I did first uh, year at the school. Oh, yeah. And uh, so I didn't have that much chance to fabricate things with me. Mm-hmm. Um, so I see this course as a chance to make the work. Great. So wait, we have, you're from Turkey as well, right? You're from Greece? Yes. Celine is from Turkey, right? Aren't you? Are you in Turkey right now? Yes, I'm in Istanbul still. Hmm? I'm in Istanbul still, yes. Ah, okay, great. So uh, sometimes I take a, a little bit of a survey of what you, our nationalities are. I think we're a pretty diverse group here right now. Um, how many, just curious, how many American, like US Americans are here? Okay, we are in the minority. Well, yeah, I think we're in the minority. That's okay. And so we got one Indian, one Greek, one Turk. Um, hmm? Two Turkish. Oh, you're also Turkish. That's right. Three Turkish. Great. Um, what other nationalities do we have? You're kind of Greek, second generation, first first generation American. So we got one and a half Greeks, uh, one German. I'm both German and American, by the way. Um, any other nationality? No? Okay, great. Well, you're Canadian, right? Yeah. That counts. Okay. <laughs> As a foreigner, no? <laughs> um, yeah. I know. We're, we're hosting the World Cup next year together. Yeah, it's my, uh, soccer, this is, uh, football. Yeah. yeah, Canada, Mexico, and the US. It's a pretty large host, huh? Yeah, that's right. And uh, this summer, there's a UEFA World Cup final. 
in Berlin while we're there. By the way, if you're not signed up for Prep Berlin, another awesome class, even as a graduate, you can absolutely participate. Um, and you will be uh, going to see uh, the live uh, streaming of the UEFA Cup final in Berlin with us, if you want. Um, okay, so great. Thank you very much. And what's your name? Yeah, I remember. Yeah. I very much appreciate it, by the way, your material research on the sulfur and concrete. There was, uh, it was a, a really wonderful, I want to say, balance in your work uh, with a, a very, let's say, scientific approach and sort of the ambition to really go through with a scientific routine and on the other side with a real immersion into design and the uh, uh, more visceral effects that you were able to achieve with this very particular uh, material composite of sulfur and, and concrete. So whether or not you continue that here is completely up to you. There's always a chance to deepen the research or to uh, start a new trajectory. Okay, so Rachel already introduced. Um, she was in my um, housing studio, just like these guys and Celine were the year before. Um, so I will try to avoid any references to public housing whatsoever because you've heard me talk about it forever. I might have to talk about structure a little bit, Emily. I don't know if you've seen this uh, talk I gave last semester about structuration, uh, in, actually in the context of the What is Design uh, seminar. And I was referencing Emily and her partners, uh, Valentina's work from a year ago because I was, and I will be in, in another way, do the same thing here in this seminar, uh, try to define or introduce the term structure and the multiple readings. You know what I'm getting at, right? Because at one point, Emily came with all these I-beams in the plants when I said, we need to have more structure as an organization. And there were like a lot of I-beams. Um, one of my favorite anecdotes of the last year or so. Thank you very much, Emily, for serving us this wonderful humorous event i don't know if everybody got it but um anyway so um welcome everybody it's a it's a real pleasure meeting you i feel like i've i've known all of you i've been on several reviews of yours you were also in my seminar um and i I've, i think matt over there i've seen you on so many reviews um, probably always in my sort of sister studio section or something. Were you in Eric's class or? Okay, yeah. And I think this, I feel the same about you guys. And um, okay, so I, I prepared a, a little slideshow, um, perhaps not so little. And um, let me try to get that started. Now I lost the connection. Okay, so I want to keep the tabs open and at the same time show this slideshow. I have a technical question later for you. Maybe you can remind me. <laughs> um, has to do with Microsoft Office. Oh. That whole package doesn't work on my new machine and I wanted to make sure it does. So I had to resort to keynotes here. It's actually quite an elegant program. I just never used it before. And let's see how many slides do we have and how many do we want to show today? Um, yeah, this is 300 slides. So let me just start with the first one so we can get through with this. By the way, I forgot to have Celine introduce herself. Sorry about that. Remote participant. If you want to quickly introduce yourself too, if you like. Yeah, sure. Can you hear me? I can. Yeah, okay. 
Um, I'm Celine and I'm also from Turkey. I graduated from Istanbul Technical University, Bachelor of Architecture. And I took this course because both the research and the representational aspects look very interesting. And I don't know what I'm going to work on yet, but I'm excited about it. Okay, welcome Celine to Istanbul. And um, with this, I'm going to launch this slideshow here. How do I put that on full screen or? Yeah. yeah, that's a good idea. So let's see if I can navigate within this too. Let's go back to the star. Okay, let's do this. Here we go. All right. Um, Celine, can you just, because I don't see the Zoom screen anymore, can you just tell me if you see the slides and if you can hear me? I can hear you, but I see a very small portion of the slide. Can so, you turn the camera a little bit? Okay, okay. So maybe first I have to put share screen on the Zoom. Thank you. Share screen and then actually launch the slideshow that should work better can you see it better now yes i do okay great Thanks. so i think we're sharing screen now you guys all see that on your computers mm -hmm. um by the way you're more than welcome to use your mobiles for texting and chatting and TikToking as long as it is related to what we're doing in class there's always a hashtag nanotectonica and it's really deeply relevant to what we're doing here. Okay. Um, <clears throat> okay, so welcome to nanotectonica 2024. Um, during COVID, we're all like, we had enough about COVID and heard enough about it. But it was interesting what it did to this seminar because it gave us or gave me the opportunity to really focus deep on the previous decade or so of teaching this and developing the research and formalizing something. So I did a few things during COVID uh, when I had to teach this completely online. In fact, I remember uh, spring 2020 um, when uh, the virus was about to make it over to North America starting on the West Coast at exactly this time of the year. So it's very clear what was about to happen, but institutionally we didn't have all the mechanisms in place yet. So what that what, what eventually became hybrid teaching and learning was something that we actually first tested in this very seminar. And there was perhaps always an interesting um, conversation about uh, both the scientific even medical, but also the cultural implications that the virus had. We see here um, a solar eclipse on the one side, um, and we see the virus under an electron microscope on the other side. So one is at um, planetary scale. So the solar radiation, the arrows that go out from the sun at the um, image on the right side, those are um, referred to as the corona of the solar eclipse. And that is where the name really comes from. Um, just like the spikes of the little coronavirus, right? Um, and I'm gonna go into this a little bit further in a moment when I introduce uh, sort of the a, a mid, mid size introduction to the course. Um, why I'm saying it here also is because it, uh, this phase allowed me to formalize or um, maybe organize a little bit more tightly um, the, the huge wealth of research material that has been produced in nanotectonica over that time. It really is a lot of work, um, amazing stuff, um, both uh, material produced in the nanotectonica lab at the scanning electron microscope as well as design research material and design research production. So I've done a couple of things. First of all, I, I made a little intro clip as the asked us as a teaser for the seminar. Then I made a little bit of a larger first session video as they asked us to do it. I also set up an Instagram account, Nanotectonica, 
where we over the last four years had accumulated all of the SEM original images. Unfortunately, and this is a little bit of an anecdote at the side, <clears throat> Meta decided to eliminate all accounts of minors. And when we set up the Nonotectonica Instagram account, we gave it the birthday of when we set it up, which was, I don't know, 2020 or something. And so they eliminated it because they thought it was a minor. Um, I don't know if this is something you want to help me with, but I've tried already unsuccessfully last year to recover that account. So really great amount of information on it, which you will get anyway in any other in another form, but for the general public, it was accessible. Another thing is that I um, put together a book, which is not published yet. However, it is um, unofficially online and I'll give you access to it, which comprises all of these trajectories of nanotectonica, both the historical as well as the design research production aspects. And then, um, I want to also share with you the individual chapters of that book whenever it's relevant. I'm saying this as a preface because you will see a couple of the outputs from that time, 2021 about, because that's when we recorded all this and just gonna have this as sort of an extra element for you guys. Um, so one of the clips is here, this early teaser, you see me without a head um, on this one. And let me try to um, pull it up as a quick intro. Um, it's one minute, this is really very quick. So trying to sort of gradually approach an understanding of what this course is or could be. Um, it is intentionally ambiguous and highly structured at the same time, meaning um, it could be understood as fairly complex what this is about, but it's also very, very simple to follow because it has a pretty well-established structure to it. Um, and once we sort of understand that structure, we can totally uh, deploy the structure or also destruct it and reinvent it. But there's not any reason for uh, feeling uh, floating at any point because you can always refer back to that structure and I'll introduce what that is in a minute. Um, so let me try to pull up this little clip. Nanotectonica examines the relationship between so-called natural and architectural systems through the convergence of nanotechnology and contemporary design tools. It is a design research and production project that studies structures and organizations at multiple scales. Nanotectonica discusses changing concepts of nature as they pertain to ecological thinking and building and the architectural mandate in the midst of a global climate crisis. It points at the problem of distinguishing nature from technology, investigates a new understanding of living systems in both human-made ecological realities and artificial AL scenarios, and offers an integrated reading of the term natural structures. The design research employs nanotechnology, specifically the scanning electron microscope and digital tools of analysis for a deeper understanding of carbon-based and algorithmic structures at various scales. The investigation is not limited to the phenotypical expression of such structures, but seeks to decipher and invent their organizing and form building principles. The study well, refers to a lineage of naturalists, microscopists, engineers, and thinkers that have explored the micro world and addressed the concept of the smallest. It critically discusses ideas of bionics and biomimicry and rejects scientific and design methods that idealize and introduce nature to an empirical field of investigation. Nanotectonica aims to communicate a sense of urgency for overcoming a human-centric view of the world that has legitimized the exploitation of our planet and led to near social and ecological collapse. All right. Uh, let me just see. Celine, were you able to hear the audio of this video clip? Yes, I can hear it. Okay. All right. Great. Sometimes you have to change the screen sharing to the sound in it. Okay. Wonderful. As a first glimpse, if you have any questions at any point, please just jump in. OK. 
Okay. So you see here grayed out the different aspects that we want to cover briefly today. So this was just the intro clip. And now we're coming to a summary, which is um, the same text that you'll find on the PrEP webpage. But I want to go through it with you um, real quick. We just focus on the white words here. So you see the term natural either in quotation marks or capitalized, um, which approaches the very topic we just discussed. What is that anyway? Nature. It's a very rich topic. Um, so it does examine the relationships between natural and architectural systems. And you could say that these groups could be one anyway, um, just as a sort of a bold um, radical approach to nature, you could say, as we are part of nature, everything that humans do is natural, right? That's a very, very simple approach. We can expand that idea a little bit further and we will, um, but just as a mindset, try to perhaps for a moment to question the idea that we are distinct from nature, just as a start. And it will get into all the post-humanist and post-anthropocentric ideas eventually, but I think that's a good start to just think we are part of nature. In fact, you could say that there was a particular point in human history, or at least in Western history, um, around the 17th century, when we started to see ourselves outside of the natural world. So the at least 1,500 years prior to that in the Western world, we um, understood humans as the larger natural world under God. So there was a strict hierarchy, God on the one side and rest of it all on the other side, which uh, actually created a certain kind of parity between humans, uh, animals, plants, fungi, and stones, um, which was then changed when we, um, in a certain sense, I want to say emancipated ourselves from that strict idea of God hovering above everything. But we shifted the hierarchy towards a human being on top of a somewhat hierarchical pyramid. And <clears throat> one could argue, and I am, that that actually truly is the beginning of the Anthropocene. So not just when the bomb was developed or the steam engine was developed, but when we changed our attitude towards nature as something other than us. So the moment we established that distinction, what came up? Oh, yes. Maybe I triggered it with some yeah. keyword. <laughs> nature and balloons come up. Should have that as a, <laughs> a seminar specific app in here. Um, so the moment that we um, took ourselves out of that universe, that we are separate from nature, it was also the very moment that humans started to control the non-human nature, investigate it, and ultimately start to exploiting it or her or whatever. And that came in correlation and in very rapid interaction with the technological development. So one thing that we're looking at in this seminar is the relationship between, on the one side, philosophical thoughts and concepts and cultural ideas. And on the other side, development of early modern science and technology and how those two have impacted human view of nature and concepts of the idea of nature. It's a really super interesting correlation. And some of the things that we take for granted are actually changing over time. Um, so the very beginning here, the relationship between natural and architectural systems, you already now can perhaps look at in a slightly different way than only 10 minutes ago. And through the conversion, here's another couple, of nanotechnology and design tools. So um, what does that mean? So nanotechnology is actually any technology that operates at a sub-visible scale, meaning sub-visible to the human eye. 
Um, so <clears throat> that may be that the dimensions are measured in nanometers, right? If you're looking at like a hundredth of the diameter of a hair, for instance, that's something that you are at the threshold between nano and micrometers, which is kind of where we're operating. Um, so technology, nanotechnology here, actually the term globally speaking refers to both the analysis and the imaging of phenomena at the scale of the nanometer, as well as the production operation manipulation at that scale. So the second part of it is probably less of a uh, interest for us, but it is the visualization and the experience of the imaging technology, which is in and of itself something that is conceptually very rich for us. The other term is design tools. So what are design tools? Um, I think we've established last semester that that is a very broad uh, ontological discussion in and of itself, what is design, and then what is design tools. You could say any and all these tools are already design tools, but more specifically, we're referring here to contemporary media as they um, are prominent in the design, uh, academic design community. Now that might have been 15, 20 years ago, parametric engines um, of let's say uh, rhino grasshopper or all kinds of other script-based engines. And it may currently be prominently um, artificial intelligence engines. But for us specifically, it's not limited to that. You can find technologies and media applications that are relevant to design in all kinds of ways and uh, to test them in combination with the nanotechnology is one of the, let's say, when it comes to the media tech and one of the uh, interests of the seminar. So we are interested in research and uh, production of uh, structures and organizations at multiple scales. And we use both the computational design and fabrication techniques to uh, grow, construct, build. And with these three terms, we already have a little bit of the discussion of what's our role in that process anyhow, uh, novel material systems and intricate assemblies and architectural artifacts. Um, so yes, we are asking you by the end of the semester to have also produced a physical artifact um, though we can have a conversation about uh, how much you expand the idea of physical matter. Um, you can make a, a case for the transition between physical and uh, let's say digital material to be uh, rather smooth or liquid, if not non-existent in that case. Um, that would become a topic of your research. But generally speaking, we do want to mess with material and not as a deliverable. It's not so much about in, at the end of the semester producing a pristine architectural object, but rather to engage with it throughout the semester um, for the purpose of this uh, inquiry. So I mentioned already that the concepts of nature um, as they pertain to ecological thinking and building um, are super interesting to us um, as they are really at the, you want to say the substrate for many of the um, opportunities we have, but also for the enormous challenges. And there can be no class anymore taught without having global climate crisis in the foreground um, because this is affecting all of us and your generation and the generation of your children in a, in a very severe way. So we'll do everything we possibly can to cultivate beautiful young minds, to be particularly mindful about these matters and discussing uh, positive, sustainable futures, even in the context of a highly uh, theoretical and design-oriented class, or particularly in one of those. The scientific and design aspects have been really going hand in hand in that uh, historical development that I was referring to earlier with the development of new technologies, with the development of modern thought and ideas of modern science, uh, worldview of nature has developed that actually um, has made the very crisis, the self-made global crisis possible. 
Um, so the understanding is that we are not primarily out to develop technologies to, in a certain sense, technocratically address particular problems of the global climate crisis. But we want to start at the worldview, if you will, the concept of nature. And the understanding is if that if we approach a more, let's say, sustainable idea about that concept, that ultimately um, all the manifestations of the global climate crisis that can be combated by with architectural means uh, will naturally be promoted in any event. Um, I mentioned briefly the understanding of the relationship uh, between carbon-based and algorithmic structures or what we used to call natural structures and synthetic structures. If we overcome that uh, distinction and understand that there are common uh, principles that we can uh, transpose from one to the other domain and return while being aware that there are uh, clear differences, I think we're already on our way towards a more sustainable design future. So when it says here, and you saw that also in the clip, that we're interested not only in the phenotypical expressions, but also in the <clears throat> form building principles of these systems, what do I mean by that? Uh, maybe we can just def define very briefly, and somebody might want to do this in more detail, um, uh, distinction terminology that uh, Christopher Langton, the father of artificial life, has uh, come up with, um, being the phenotype on the one side and the genotype on the other side, the genotype being the fundamental substrate and the phenotype being the visible expression of a system, right? So you could say that in a, in a script, one is the code, the other one is what you see on the screen or put out by the, com by the robot. One is the, perhaps the scripted ground of the tool paths and the other one is the artifact as an example. Now, these don't have to necessarily come in physical form, um, but the relationship between a phenotypical expression and uh, the, the genetic substrate of that expression, that's a really interesting relationship that's interesting for biology. And it's interesting for artificial life, which understands itself as a subset of biology, actually. Um, and we study this in the lineage of naturalists, microscopists, engineers, and thinkers that have explored the micro and nano world, world and addressed the concept of the smallest. So here um, we are taking a critical look at ideas of biomimicry and bionics. And we also reject these scientific methods that are actually putting natural structures and systems out there to be explored, exploited, as a purely empirical field of investigation. So these are a couple of things here. One implies a critique to a classical um, approach to biomimicry, which means that biomimicry as the, is in the name is in the business of precisely replicating natural structures and organizations, um, which is fundamentally problematic as we understand that all these systems, natural systems that undergo an evolutionary process, they're never finite, they're never at any kind of endpoint or idealized moment in their development. So what is it that one would be mimicking? That's one issue. The other issue is that um, it does perhaps reveal a little bit of a human arrogance to assume that we would be able to engineer the complexity of something that has evolved over millions of years so I think with a, a more modest approach, one can actually have a with greater impact into uh, the implications for design, that is implications of the nanoscale world onto design methodology. Okay, so I mean, just like in a nutshell, the last sentence says, and I really mean it, I do consider that as part of my obligation as an educator that we at least want to communicate a sense of urgency when it comes to overcoming a human-centric view of the world, because that is exactly what has legitimized the exploitation of our planet 
and led to the near social and ecological collapse that we find ourselves witnessing in right now. Um, okay, we also want to have fun. So I, I also want to make sure that you can be a very conscientious and responsible designer and have a lot of fun designing. I don't think that these are opposites at all. And if you embrace that, I think you'll uh, find the joy in doing work that's serious fun. Okay, so let's scroll through some visuals here. Um, having said exactly that, it's also for fun. And um, my idea of fun goes a lot through the visual apparatus. I don't know about you guys, but many of us are uh, visually oriented people. So I'm gonna not hold back the pretty images that I have to share. Here's a quick scroll through one minute. And we start by seeing um, fabrication experiments and it moves into drawings. And there's very little interest in sort of pure representational strategies. There are always the interest in representation as it relates to the generation of these systems, no matter what the material might be. And here's the hand that you might have referred to earlier. And it's so interesting to see where former students went. Oh, by the way, I have a list. I have an alumni list that I'll share with you. Maybe something to remind us of. Um, with all students who ever took this class, and then you can you have all their names and contacts, and you put your own in there. I'm saying this now because I saw this morning on Instagram, a former student uh, started a kind of a fashion line and the technique for this she developed in this class. I'm very proud of this. Uh, another student of mine um, also is currently quite out there with his company that optimizes sort of high tech uh, substrates for medical and aerospace uh, industry. Um, same student actually also did um, earlier for Victoria's Secret, these 3D printed parametric dresses that were also originate, uh, originated in the seminar. So there's a really interesting group of people. I'm not just saying this to promote this class, you're already in this class, but I wanna tell you that there's, because it is so open and it kind of attracts people that have a, a real interest in this cross section of design and technology. <clears throat> that it's really super interesting to also consider the community from my, in my mind anyway. Maybe it's because I've been teaching it so long, and, but it's uh, just a pleasure to see where, where these students uh, ended up in their professional and academic lives. For instance, uh, we gave a lecture series last semester philosophically oriented in this design class and uh, three of the lecturers were actually former uh, nanotectonica students, um, one doing a PhD, at um, University of Pennsylvania, one doing a PhD at UCLA and one at Yale. And they're all like went into very particular fields and it's really just a joy. Um, okay, let's uh, go to the next one. There's a, it says your block scroll. <clears throat> and this part is actually <coughs> curiously antiquated, if you will, which is that I'm referring now to something that you don't even know what that is anymore. It's called uh, a Facebook page or a Facebook group. Is there anybody who still uses Facebook in this class? No, this may be the first generation where you do. No. You do have an account. Okay. Well, so, I have an account. okay. So if you want to log in and just to, I, I hardly do actually anymore. Um, but this has become a nice resource. I'm scrolling down here just to show you. Um, I lost the image. Oh, here. Just to show you this as a resource. Maybe we should just put a, a link list somewhere. Um, yeah. So I'm just going to take this and copy it here. And we'll think about how we formulate that later. Um, yeah, we're going to talk about our media platform in a moment, but anyway, so this is a, a group 
that you can join. And like every single entry in this um, is very interesting. Um, okay. Jumping around a lot. Okay. So I invite you to go to Facebook groups. It says here, Nanotectonica. Maybe that's a better way of recording the link. Um, <clears throat> it will be fun. If you have a 10 minutes to scroll through this at any point, you will also get a really good idea about this seminar. There are things, I mean, I'm randomly stopping here. Uh, oh, I'm not. Let me do that. Okay. And I'm, I'm sharing it now. Okay. Yeah, here, for instance, uh, you know, Conway's uh, Game of Life, a theory and also applications that are very much in line with the artificial life discussion that we just started. Um, some examples of this go to Facebook group Nanotectonica and you find <clears throat> I'm only at the beginning and scrolling through this um, it's been building up over decades interesting stuff very new stuff too you know a new kind of geometric discoverment, discovery of a sort of non-repetitive tiling geometries um ideas and road systems to be read as military system structures um and plenty of examples of previous material explorations this one here really interesting <clears throat> a student created um urban fabrics as skin graftings uh, as a sort of a urban branding strategy so all kinds of weird and super interesting stuff comes out of this conversation. Let me return to my slides. Next up on the agenda, a mind map. So you see, I give you four, five, six, seven different approaches to understanding what this seminar is about, um, to not confine it too much, but give you different angles. So this next one, let me see if I have it. Um, So this was actually created by an app that I'm really interested in testing out all kinds of applications all the time. If you ever find some curious app um, that you wanna play around with, this is a good opportunity to introduce it to this one mind map was is actually bought by Miro. So now you should be able to, to call this app on the Miro and you have like this interactive nodal system, but I wasn't able to, to, to do this just now. So I'm just showing you screenshots. <clears throat> so this is like perhaps here as a kind of an amorphous center would be nanotectonica in this gray middle ground. Um, I don't know where my mouse is or if you could see it. No, it's all gone. So Maybe I go to the thing. Yeah, I don't have access to my screen right now. So you'll see here, we're zooming into different areas of this. So there's an area here that is leaning towards <clears throat> engineering and material science and the discussion of uh, the city and infrastructure. We have an area here that perhaps is closer to the mathematical dimension of the discussion. Um, and the mathematical here is probably at the cross section of philosophy, um, both in terms of strictly our digital world of computation algorithmics or conceptual ideas that have to do with general symbolic system and rewriting systems 
the Turing machine, the original, both uh, in terms of engineering as well as the logics idea of the modern day computer, the Turing machine. <clears throat> you guys might have heard of Alan Turing. There was even a movie out a few years ago, The Enigma. Um, so Alan Turing was not only the person who single-handedly ended World War II by cracking the Nazi code on behalf of the British, but he also invented the modern day computer. He was perhaps one of the final characters in a long lineage of logicians and engineers who developed that idea, but he ultimately put it together. Now, unfortunately, he was basically killed and by the Brits um, because he was gay. And at the time that was not allowed. So that you see this symbol here, you see the apple, right? This is not coming from a grim fairy tale directly. This comes from Alan Turing because he died because he bit a poisoned apple at night. And that's how he was killed. That's where Steve Jobs got that logo from. Um, anyway, so this is all the world of uh, computation mathematics as it relates to um, both the metaphysics and the cosmologies that we're discussing in the philosophical end, as well as it refers to the more tangible expressions in engineering, urban design, infrastructure design. <clears throat> we're moving um, also into um, highly conceptual ideas like blind probing, which is something that is uh, loosely originating from uh, post-structural ideas a la Deleuze and Guattari, but really has sort of taken on its own uh, dynamics in the very context of us actually probing with technical devices. By the way, I just got a confirmation that we are uh, scheduled to be at the New York Structural Biology Lab on the 1st of February, which is in two weeks from now. So it's a very exciting trip. <clears throat> uh, after all these years, um, I'm always very proud that I can uh, report back to you that we have um, this alliance with this uh, imaging lab. So we're going to go in two weeks. We're going to go to the Upper Upper West Side. Um, it's uh, in Harlem. <clears throat> and this time, for the first time, we are being offered to operate not only on one, but on two scanning electron microscopes. I'll talk about what that is later, but just as an announcement, in two weeks, we're not gonna be in this room, but we're gonna meet in Manhattan, Upper West Side at the uh, New York um, Microbiology Lab. Um, okay, so I tried to get this interactive map running and I send you the link on Miro. But perhaps you get the idea that there maybe there's one more thing that I want to show one other quadrant, if you will, of this uh, map here. And that goes into the direction of the historical grounds. <coughs> and over here, so we were talking about this, let's say, southwestern quadrant just now. Now we're talking about the northeastern quarter uh, in this context. If the gods of HDMI connection could be with us. Okay, so you see, uh, what if you do? You see here a bunch of characters, and they're very illustrious, a very diverse crowd of characters. And you see, you see up here with Robert Hooke, um, the first person who actually published microscopy images, also in the 17th century. He also developed microscopes himself, but primarily he is well known because he published a book um, that was called Microscopia. So nanotectonica is in a certain sense a rip of Robert Hooke's very famous picture book, one of the first picture books, if not the first popular science publication ever. Um, 
which were etchings of what he saw in the microscope, and those were published, and for the first time to a general audience. And he goes down the list from other microscopists, Anthony von Leeuwenhoek, uh, naturalists like Ernst Haeckel, Raoult Foncet, we're going to get into them deeper. But you see, these green, green links try to match them into uh, fields, basically disciplines. And you see how crazy that is if you start to do that once, because none of them really comply to one discipline. Many of them span actually the full spectrum from philosophy to art to science and engineering and design. You know, one world of understanding these fields is to just say there's really three directions. There's art, there's science, and there's philosophy, right? One deals with the concepts, philosophy that is, one deals with artistic expression, and one deals with the scientific method. We are actually approaching all three of them. And we're trying to actually question whether these categories are set in stone. Um, <clears throat> so let's move on from this to a slightly uh, more comprehensive introduction. And I'm going to uh, probably just touch upon the most, most of the topics. So um, again, as I mentioned, uh, a couple of years ago, I had an opportunity to sort of formalize these, uh, these ideas coming out of this research seminar in the context of an emergent um, global viral crisis. Um, and the very first slide I showed you of the solar eclipse and the coronavirus um, was already pointing at <clears throat> a certain kind of poetry, perhaps even written into that idea of the coronavirus, right? So that we dras at drastically different scales, <clears throat> one measured in nanometers, right? And the other measured in light years. Um, we try to, or we seem to have an affinity towards creating uh, commonalities and relationships between these drastically different scales. So that is something that points at a certain kind of curiosity and interest towards universal universality, that things would operate in a similar or the same fashion at drastically different scales, right? So that would be um, an affinity towards universality. And I think what's important to point out here is that that needs to be a reflected fascination for it to be actually meaningful, <clears throat> to just insist that everything is the same anyhow at all scales is a bit of a, perhaps a, a simplistic view of what's going on because in physics itself, we have pretty much established that size does indeed matter. So that there are certain structural uh, commonalities and relationships and self-similarities that we can explore and it's principles that hold through all kinds of scales and dimensions, but there's also the physical reality that we're dealing with. And that is um, when I say um, size does indeed matter. So again, a quick reference that the solar corona <clears throat> that aura of plasma that extends millions of kilometers from the star and the spikes of the coronavirus, which are normal to its spherical surface that extend 20 nanometer from the varian membrane, meaning this is, you know, smaller than what you can see with the bare eye. Um, so we want to talk to, about this also very briefly already from a technical perspective, which is that the electron microscope, <clears throat> unlike the regular microscope, the optical microscope, does not work with light, right? It works with electrons. 
right? And why is that so? Why do you think they invented the electron microscope? Any guess? The size, the size of what? That's right. And so that's the beginning of the answer. So size matters, yes. Mm -hmm. And how can you detect a certain Energy. scale different with electrons than with photons? <clears throat> so the wavelength of light actually determines the limits on how small we can detect things, right? Something smaller than the wavelength of light, you can't really observe it with an optical microscope anymore. These are limitations that you do not have if you're using electrons. So the, in principle, I'm giving you a nutshell and in two weeks we'll have a longer exploration uh, when we're at the lab, but principally electrons are focused, bundled and shot at the object and the electrons that reflect off the object are scanned <clears throat> and that produces a visual that is reminiscent of black and white photography. But it's important to point out and completely counterintuitive, but just keep it in your mind that electron microscopy is not photography, right? So photography implies that photons, light, have something to do with it. In electron microscopy, they don't. And scanning electron microscopy is really just a subset of electron microscopy. Mm -hmm. The visuals that are produced with scanning electron microscopy, again, that's a subset of the general field of electron microscopy, they are very spatially legible. If you see an electron microscopy image, you view it as if you were you're viewing a black and white phot photograph, right? You see shades and shadows and a certain kind of three-dimensionality cast through light and shadow as it seems. But those are just grayscale expressions of the intensity of the electron shadow, right? So they are a little bit, <clears throat> I wanna say, strange in that sense, right? There's a certain kind of a suspension of belief once you understand the workings of the electron microscope and then you still try to read the images as photography. We'll talk about this more. It's actually both a very poetic um, and I want to say in terms of the aesthetics discussion, very meaningful conversation about modes of representation, the implications of our view of the natural object. Um, and on the other side, a very pragmatic um, research, scientific research method oriented process. Um, so I'm referring again to this sort of fascination of bringing together the very large and the very small. Um, we could say that the it is the dream of uniting the two main theoretical theories of quantum mechanics and general relativity. So far, we do have a divide between those. So Einstein's theories are usually coming from a planetary scale. The gravitational theory relativity of Einstein is always at addressing the larger scale of planetary behavior. And then that scale gravitational forces are indeed the most prominent ones. If you go further down in scale to the sub-visible sub and nanoscale, things change. Suddenly electromagnetic forces are more dominant than gravitational forces. So size really does matter. And on the theoretical end, our colleagues in the speculative phys uh, physical theory are still working on uniting those two theories. So again, we are understanding this intuition, or let's say affinity of bringing these two worlds together as a driver of design momentum while we critically discuss 
to what degree <coughs> this universality is actually uh, manifesting itself in the physical world. This is a classic, and maybe actually played for a few minutes. This is a clip by Charles and Ray Lewis from 1977. I'm sure many of you have seen this before. It's called The Powers of Ten. And they did that commission for IBM, Charles and Ray Eames. How many of you have heard of that couple's name before? Ray Eames, Charles and Ray Eames. Yeah, famous chairs. <coughs> so they were um, commissioned with this uh, sort of science um, the public. The picnic near the lakeside uh, in Chicago was the start of a lazy afternoon, piece. early one October. And you know, start somewhere in a lawn in Chicago, and then it zooms out now, every into 10 seconds, intergalactic we will look from 10 space, times and then back away. in. And our field of view will be 10 uh, times wider. Just start to address the sense this of scale, is 10 perhaps wide. also address and in 10 the, seconds, the next fascination will be 10 times with universality our picture will of center on the organization and structures that we occur at both the planetary as well as the micro and nano scale. Cars crowd the highway. <coughs> Powerboats lie at their docks. Also a little bit Colorful bleachers are soldiers' fields. For a whole this square is kilometer wide, 1,000 uh, meters. The distance a racing car can travel in 10 seconds. We see the great city on the lake shore. In and out. 10 to the 4th meters, 10 kilometers. Created, the distance a supersonic airplane can travel in 10 seconds. Um, we see first the rounded many, end of Lake many, Michigan. Many, then the whole great lake, 10 to the 5th meters. Phenomenon. The distance an orbiting satellite you covers in 10 seconds. Clip, Long parades of clouds. Right now, the day's weather in the Middle West. You see that that view has 10 to the 6th, the one was six zeros, a million meters. Soon the Earth will show us a solid sphere. We are able to see the whole Earth now, just over a minute along the journey. The physical world is, the Earth uh, diminishes into the distance, but those uh, background uh, stars are so much farther away. Approach. They do not yet appear At to the move. time. We are still thinking very much in an optimistic way that there are a line extends at the true the speed of light. In one second, it half crosses the tilted orbit of the moon. Atoms understood as these little micro balls that would be just stuff, and this is the end of the scale that you can go into. Whereas right now, now we mark a small part of the path in which the Earth moves about the sun. Energy fields. Now the orbital paths of the neighbor planets, as a certain scale of Venus, tangible matter. But there's and no Mars, such thing as an then Mercury. Sort of physical, Entering our field of view is the glowing uh, center of our solar system, visible the sun. <clears throat> Followed by the massive outer planets. So I'm going to scroll swinging. through this real quick. We're going further, 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 further back. 110, 10, uh, 100 and a million light years. And then we go back into, this is the skin of this gentleman. And we're going further down. And we're going to my The nucleus within holds the heredity of the man and in the here coil we are approaching of DNA. And nanometers, right? So here as we, we are close in, we come to the double the helix DNA. itself. A molecule like a long twisted Armstrong's, ladder whose runs of paired bases spell out units. twice. In an alphabet of four letters, the words of the powerful. And how far does it go? Okay. Here we are. And this is to Together, be reminiscent of the. the <clears throat> cosmic 40 zeros background noise 40 okay or one and 40 zeros which is the what we experience as the uh, expressions of the big bang under current theory okay so next up I'm not going to talk about robotics and AI too much at this moment, but just this just to say that there is a long history of autonomous systems that are represented here by that robotic arm. And we got a really cool new one at the Pi Lab, by the way. Um, and the idea of artificial life and machinic life. On the right side, we see a very early um, artificial life expression from the 18th century a mechanical duck that came around as a, a, a at the time when modern clockworks were developed. In the history of the, the modern clock um, and the, the robot is for the most part a shared history. 
<clears throat> and we'll discuss this topic and we'll discuss all of it always in the relationship of the larger question, philosophical question of what is design. And we do it with a practical spin by exploring and testing all these approaches. Um, and here there's uh, perhaps me trying to state or trying to parse out different approaches to even just the term design research. What is design research? And I'm saying that there are three linked modes of inquiry. And then bear with me for a second, everybody, because it becomes a little bit more complex for just one moment. But maybe after that, you will be even more appreciative of the kind of research and how we define that research. So what is design research? I'm saying here actually has three linked modes of inquiry. <clears throat> so the first one, and it is the one also that we've been discussing in the previous seminar this fall, um, is concerned with the concept of design itself, right? So it discusses the creative act, in quote, and the relationship of media and methods. Um, and the second one is project-based research. So that you're all familiar with. Any architecture studio you ever took, usually it's at the beginning of the semester, design research that's project oriented, meaning that the research is asked a very particular question, nam namely how to support a design project. So examples of design research in that very practical sense, you all have all experienced, right? Maybe you were in a class where you're, I don't know, watching a tennis match or a football match and you're mapping the behaviors and the strategies and you derive some kind of design trigger or prompt from that. Or you're looking into historical precedents um, of perhaps architectural expression or even architectural discourse and have that inform your design project. Or it may be a sort of site analysis or programmatic analysis or analysis of a client, ecology, environmental, condition the context of a project right so this would all fall under the straightforward core category of uh, project oriented design research so again i'm talking to you guys right now about the definition of design research um, very very useful to think about it you don't have to adopt or adapt the three different definitions that i give to you but to think about that in the first place is very advisable, especially if you're uh, thinking about going into uh, or to remain in academia, right? So if a lot of what we're doing is research, and people sometimes ask you, what is research anyway? If you uh, talk to a colleague in the natural sciences and you talk about design research, they immediately question whether or not that falls into research itself, because I have a very different definition of what research is. However, the third mode of inquiry that I consider as one of the three link modes is actually very close and related to the scientific method and therefore <clears throat> has a very easy way to be declared as design research because it actually adopts the scientific method and even tools and devices from fields that are primarily about research, material science, for instance, right? So the third one you could argue is original research production, right? So there's stuff that comes out at the end of that research that actually is tangible uh, research material in the form of, in our case, of the electron microscopy images that we are originally producing. And I just wanna let you guys know what you're doing in the lab there is very, very precious. The access to these machines is very, very, let's say, privileged. Not many people get to these labs. Uh, people that work in electron microscopy labs they have a very particular um, code of, I want to say hygiene, um, because everything can affect these devices, any kind of magnetic fields, any kind of vibrations, any kind of sound waves. So it's a you know, it's a real privilege that we have to access these machines. But to put this in a global context, it's not only about being able to produce really beautiful images, and they are, and I deeply appreciate the aesthetic, 
quality of them, and I am equally fascinated uh, by them. But this is just to warm you up to the idea that we're going there for more than just the enjoyment of these visuals, but actually the experience of the process of producing these images, which in and of itself, and that's the part where it becomes a little bit more conceptual, is also actually a really good, I wanna say shorthand or dry run or a quick shot at a speculative design routine. The way that you interact with the electron microscope and ultimately with the specimen that you're observing is very meaningful on different levels and actually super awesome training, especially for those of you who have been working on bringing together the more, let's say, cerebral mind and perhaps even the scientific and technological explorations that you've been undergoing in architecture school with the more intuitive mind. So to develop, and believe it or not, that is the highest skill, a gentle touch when working with architectural media, right? So there's one thing to be savvy and knowledgeable about the technologies and media, and there's another to skillfully and elegantly operate in that way. And that's something that you can actually test. So the speculative design routine, which is the ultimate goal of what we're practicing, including the research aspects of it, <clears throat> is can always be practiced. If you almost think about it like an exercise routine at the gym, you go into, you know, whatever, a weight room to cultivate and grow a certain muscle group or something like that, right? So you have a machine that is specifically crafted so you can work on that particular skill or that particular muscle group. In a similar way, I would argue that the work on the electron microscope is next to the real production of the material. It's also through experience, through an intense training of the visual and creative apparatus, a short form for acquiring a speculative design routine. Um, I will read a text that I wrote about this. Uh, if we don't get to it today, then next time. And I'll definitely share the link to it with you. <clears throat> so here you see some examples of the SEM visuals. Okay, we have another hour, so I have to hurry up a little bit. Um, so I talked about the relationship between the sensor to <clears throat> the sensory device, meaning <clears throat> you could understand the electron microscope and the standing electron microscope in particular as an extension of our own bodies, just like the telescope, the, the yeah. eyeglasses, the hearing aid, whatever, the prosthetic device. I think the larger discussion, and Emily pointed at some interest about the post-humanist discussion, is that the boundaries of ourselves are discussed in a very, very different way these days than they traditionally have been in classic modern science. Um, uh, perhaps the most immediate example is this, of course, where perhaps it's sometimes hard to say where does yourself begin or end. There's a physical condition that is on an obvious level, a distinction between those two, but in all actual reality, uh, things are not that clear. <clears throat> With the evolution of technology or the development of technology, you could also uh, make a case about the age of technologies and how far technologies are integrated into our daily lives um, also changes our perspective onto them, whether or not they're part of us or part of a technological domain outside of us. So for instance, if we're talking about fire and cooking, that is a technology that was once invented by humans we don't necessarily consider that as a technology anymore because it's become second nature to make fire, to heat up and to pre-digest food through cooking 
is something we don't actually consider a technology anymore, but it is an example for something that once was an inventive technology that's so old and so much become part of our lives that we don't see it as such anymore. Um, <clears throat> okay. This is really just about the history of the course. I don't know how far that is relevant other than to say that it emerged at a time or it was founded at a time when we were all together at a different phase of the, the digital or the algorithmic and architecture. Um, when perhaps parametric ideas were interesting in conceptual terms, they've been perhaps explored with too much intensity since then so that we can't really say that that in and of itself is a sort of forward-looking research agenda, but as a historical ground, a very important one. So we will also be talking about the early algorithmic project, um, sometimes called also the parametric um, project, um, but our conversation about it will be definitely critical and historical terms. What are the shortcomings and the promises of that kind of algorithm, algorithmic architecture? <clears throat> to put it in a broader context, and we'll refer back to this a lot, you could say that the critique of design as this compositional output from a singular author in a transcendental way, basically challenging, channeling some kind of, um, let's say, superhuman power into a design object. That's a traditional idea, right? Lightning strikes, you got a genius idea, and there we go. Yeah, the genius architectural artifact is created. Now, we want to entirely overcome that idea right um, and yeah so just in terms of the positioning of the algorithmic project in the longer uh, time of modern history you could say that already at the beginning of the 20th century or the turn from the 19th to the 20th century, the, the modern avant-garde in architecture in particular, generally in design, was already questioning this more classical approach to design and the relationship between the designer to the design object and call it perhaps the critique of the compositional routine, right? Where the designer or architect hands-on is in the middle of the design process at any point crafting the phenotypical expression, always operating on the phenotypical expression. That's a term that we just defined earlier, remember? When we were saying here's genotype, there's phenotype. You guys remember that? Okay, so that was questions already 120, 130 years ago with the avant-garde then, right? Looking for generative approaches to design where the designer wouldn't necessarily operate on the architectural artifact itself or its phenotypical expression, but rather on the ground rules that constitute such a phenotypical expression. Now, so that whole idea was revived at the end of the 20th century when computers finally made it into architectural domain, like by the early 1990s, perhaps. Um, I've experienced it in the mid 90s at MIT and in the light, late 90s, 2000s, at Columbia, which were at the time perhaps the foreground, forefront of <clears throat> bringing computational routines into the field of architectural design. So now that these machines were available, the original critique of the compositional routine towards a more generative routine suddenly manifested itself in a very, very concrete way. Uh, first by the use of 3D authoring tools, basically the CAT tools from AutoCAD to Maya and Rhino, um, time-based operations, and then through scripting to really almost like mechanically symbolize the relationship between a genotype and a phenotype, the genotype being the script, the phenotype being 
the whatever ultimately rendered or 3D printed geometry. So just, just to say that if you're thinking about the digital world of architecture that's only 30 years old or the algorithmic project at large, it's not a new thing. It's a new expression of a critique that's been around for much longer than that. This, by the way, also an output from the seminar is a taxonomy. The next, not this, but the next uh, finger exercise next week will be to start devising taxonomies as organizational principles. And I will also share with you a text that I wrote about the significance for speculative design to deploy the making of such taxonomies in and of itself as uh, design drivers. And here we see different examples. I'll explore a little bit the idea of um, the creation of taxonomies as basically directing design engines. Here we see a couple of covers of <clears throat> the authors that we are going to be studying, uh, some of them anyway. Uh, you see at the very top left, the beginning, uh, the Micrographia by Robert Hooke that I mentioned. And then you see more contemporary texts here on this side. And these are some spreads from Raoul Francais' uh, exploration. I'll get into it in a second. Here we see some placeholders for perhaps the relationship of the geometric discussion as a kind of a layer over the uh, genotypical exploration. You see on the bottom left, this is a hand scripted GV script. So this is predating Rhino by about five years um, in a very early installation of nanotectonica, maybe the first kind of geometric based scripting at Pratt at all. Maybe that's a bold statement, but I'm pretty sure. So this is a VB script on the bottom left and at the, around the same time, completely manual analysis of these natural structures. Why is this flickering? Is this, on, is this here or in the wall, the problem? I try not to touch anything. Um, Here more visuals, um, a lot of architectural artifacts. Now, why do we use that weird term artifacts and not just say models? They're all models. You can call them models. That's as a global term, wonderful word. Um, so in architecture, we have the scaled models as this uh, seemingly disciplinary object that we all know what that is, right? So there's a scale. 16th of an inch, 30 second, whatever, one to 1,000, one to 500. And we're scaling the thing down and then we have a model and we know what that building will be. But that's a sort of conventional understanding of what a model is in architecture. But there are different kinds of models. There are also <clears throat> the performative models that we're talking about where we're using material effects to directly inform not just the uh, the form itself, but also the dimensions of a structure, right? Now, when I say architectural artifact, it's slightly different. The architectural artifact is already architecture. It's not a placeholder for another structure at another scale, right? But the architectural explorations are taking place with the object itself which is not to say that you can't think about aspects of it as potentially being scaled into a larger scale, but that's not the point. It's not to be a scaled model in an architectural sense of the word of model, but it is the artifact itself. So that implies that for something to be architectural, it is actually not necessary that it holds any of the standard requirements of a building, meaning it has a size that a human can enter or occupy 
or it needs to operate in a building context on a site, or it needs to have a functional program, all of these standard understandings of what is architecture, we can just sort of forget <clears throat> and think about what is architectural about this artifact. The way that you narrate the object may or may not have something to do with its emergence, its production and where it comes from, or it may have to do with the effects that it produces uh, through architectural means. Anyway, I'm just uh, starting to explain to you why I am referring to the architectural artifact rather than the model as sort of a physical output at the end. Um, let me also take a moment and define another term. Actually, I do this when uh, Rachel is back because it has something to do with an admin image. The term that I wanted to define is actually, I defined nano right earlier which technically is really only all the stuff at the, that's the size that needs to be measured in nanometers, not meters or kilometers or yards or whatever. That's it, right? There's no other distinction. Everything is nano world altogether already, but we refer to it when we need those units to define it. Um, so of the word nanotectonica, completely made up word. I made that up 20 years ago. I, was inspired, as I pointed out, by a much, much older book called Micrographia by Robert Hooke. So it has a similar ring to it. It's not micro, it's nano. It's not graphia, but tectonica. <clears throat> so that gives you a first clue that it's perhaps not necessarily only about visuals and the concepts of visual representation, but also about tectonics. So nanotectonica, uh, comprised of these two terms, right? Nano and tectonica. So what does tectonica mean? What does tectonics mean? This is a word that you guys have heard tossed around many, 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 many times over at least the last two and a half years. So it may just be good to get a legit sort of definition down on what that means in architecture. Anybody have an idea what tectonics means? Anybody? No, it's okay if you don't. Yeah. Can you explain maybe to the rest of the underground and how it's formed or not? Um, it that is a very good way of defining the term in geological terms. Mm -hmm. So it is also a technical terms term in the world of geology and plate and tectonics. Mm -hmm. She's referring to the uh, continental planetary plates that are shifting all the time, inducing volcanoes to erupt and new mountain ridges to build and form. It is definitely related. Um, it is not the definition that is used in architecture itself, but it is a related definition in geology. I'm at the point where I'm describing or helping define the term tectonics or tectonica. And the reason why I'm turning to you now <laughs> <laughs> you <laughs> what do you think is coming <laughs> the reason i'm turning to you now is that just before the class i was like oh damn it's too bad that meta has discontinued our instagram account because it was too young um and i signed up for a new one just at the fly while i was driving here it's like maybe we can use this instead of Slack and all figure that out. But anyway, so just signed up for a new account called <clears throat> Nanotecton, just skipping the ICA at the end because that they blocked that name. Um, anyway, the reason why I'm putting this out there is because let's start with the even simpler one, Tecton. Like building? That's right. So Tecton, you're Greece, Greek, right? Comes from Greek and basically means the carpenter. Right, so the tecton is the carpenter, the woodworker. <clears throat> so tectonica or tectonics, and this definition is basically borrowed by Kenneth Frampton. I don't know if anybody heard the name Kenneth Frampton before. He's an elderly statesman, you could say, of architecture, a British import to New York or um, the USA, uh, a very, very important figure in the world of architecture history, I would say, 
um, he basically invented the whole idea of regional uh, critical regionalism and the sort of regional expressions of modernity all around the world. He's also a big scholar on Corbusier. Um, but he also defined the, the word tectonics and it's basically relating to the Greek origin of the word, um, which refers to the ax or the utensil or the tool that the carpenter works with. So tectonics in an architectural sense, really the best description is the relationship of matter and geometry as it relates to what you can do with a carpenter's tool. So if you, with the ax, you manipulate the wood to carve into the wood to create an opportunity of putting two pieces of wood together in a form of a joinery, perhaps. That's really at the core of what tectonic stands for. So it has something to do with the material behavior and the relationship between the material and the tool and the maker and the constructor, but it also equally has to do with the geo geometric articulation of what in this interaction comes about and also what it produces in one of the most fundamental ambitions of architecture, which is putting things together, right? So that's tectonics explained in my definition with a little bit of a riff of Kenneth Frampton's idea and the reference, the etymological reference to the Greek origin of the word. So from now on, you can even more confidently toss around that term. <clears throat> and for you, and that's why I mention it, uh, maybe we should look into it. We can do it right after class quickly. Um, I've had this really cool Slack account for Nana Tectonica, and then Slack changed their business model. And now I have to pay for every single participant in that Slack account, which is a little annoying and expensive. So I'm trying to migrate out of Slack, perhaps. Unless you all want to do Slack because you use it anyway, we can discuss it. But I was thinking maybe to adopt a new technology always or platform, maybe we can not even necessarily use the Instagram account, but use the thread account, you know, threads. So thread comes out of Instagram, but it's more like Twitter where you can like do word-based stuff. And what I'm trying to figure out, if we could sort the wealth of information that I'm sharing with you, you only have to access that thread account and that you not just see posts like you did on the Facebook page, but also, if there's a way to structure categories of information like you do in a Slack that you have like a folder or a, you know, some kind of sorting device, right? That's something I wanna look into with you. Anyway, that, that domain, that Instagram account is nanotecton, right? <clears throat> okay, here we see a bunch of images from the electron microscopy labs. I'm so thrilled actually. The new one, I don't want to geek out too much, but the new one is a phenom, which is an SEM that has a much higher resolution than what we've been working with in previous years. Here you see very different electron microscopes. So the one on the right side is actually from that lab. Uh, in the middle center, I don't know if you see my mouse when I go hover over it here. This is actually at the, in this one and that one, you see how ancient this monitor is. This is actually from the Interdisciplinary Nanotechnology Institute at the University of Kassel, where I was a guest professor a number of years ago. And there, unlike Pratt, the university had a nanotechnology institute and lab within the university. So there I was able to interact on a, a different way with our colleagues in the material science, et cetera. But anyway, you see the technology is actually not that novel. <laughs> Sorry. So the, the functioning of the electron microscope and the scanning electron microscope, as I briefly introduced it just now, is actually already 80 years or so old. And what we see here is like a really old machine. They used to fill a whole room bigger than this. As with computers, everything shrunk, and now they have desktop digitalized, digitized versions of it all. Um, but anyway, it's a really fun thing to geek out about. So there's a really deeply philosophical narrative that I'm exploring with you about the validity of using these devices in the context of speculative design. And that's not very intuitive because you could think if you put speculative design 
in the realm of the generative design and the critique of the classical compositional routine on the one side, and you put the scientific method on the other side in terms of how directed and how premeditated are things versus how open and speculative are they, you could think that using a microscope is actually pointing at a fairly mechanistic view of the world as well as understanding of architectural design. In other words, the microscope, since its invention in the 17th century, was always already a, always a expression of the scientific method, which also includes a particular relationship between the observer and the object, right? Very mechanistic. That's the object of investigation. This is the scientist. This is the device in the middle of it. We are manipulating in a directed manner. The researcher, the designer here, manipulating the specimen, the design material there without any interaction per se. That's the classical mode, which we are trying to overcome. So something that's on the surface actually is a device that represents a very mechanistic approach. The way that we think about it is the exact opposite because it opens up a space of speculative exploration. Um, some of the artifacts, architectural artifacts, this is an about, yeah, this spans like three years. This is somewhere between like 2016 and 2021. Um, you see a bunch of 3D printing, but also multimedia uh, composites. I mentioned the skin here, which are really interesting. Installations, um, we have had years where the Nanotectonica group decided to do one project altogether. Normal years, we have either individual projects or teams of two. <clears throat> we want to establish that organically. In a few weeks, we'll have a discussion about that. If there's a lot of group energy and an ambition to create something at scale that's substantial, I'd be happy to help coordinate a group effort um, or smaller groups or individuals. We can discuss that. Actually, there's a uh, this one here. I just noticed it's not there anymore. For years, it was in the hall, in the on the landing, on the staircase, if you remember that. I don't know what happened to it. I didn't put it there and I didn't take it away. It's been sitting there for, let's see, five years, four years, if it was removed last year. Um, I was happy to walk by it. It's another form of insulation. This one was not a larger group. It was just two students together doing it. Um, okay, I mentioned size matters. Maybe I skip through this and reserve that for last for next time so I can cover a little bit more ground. But this is uh, just a physical understanding of this simple statement, size matters. I'll get back to that last, next time. Here you see, you know, if we were to scale up in a nutshell, an apes, an ape, for instance, to become as big as King Kong, um, it would have to be much, much bulkier than a standard ape, <clears throat> right? Because mass factors in exponentially and the bones need to carry themselves. You can't just linearly scale up things, just a sort of first hint at that discussion. Um, now this is, by the way, this is an, the next slide is an old slide. Don't look at any of the numbers, just to give you an idea we want to focus the first half of the semester on these different exercises and phases of design research and production that I laid out in very distinct assignments for you. The good thing here is that it's a fairly tight structure that you can always use as your orientation, but because it's formally so structured, content-wise it's extremely open and allows you to explore exactly your field of interest. And then in the second half, <clears throat> we want to move into um, fabrication as a primary sort of focus of what we're doing. 
a quick glance at the syllabus and you will find, is it possible that you invite people to our internal Google group? If I, sh I share with you a Google Drive, right, today, can you, do you have authority to invite other people? If so, just invite everybody, please. Um, I'm sharing with you this Google Drive that we're going to use at our main platform. That's why I share resources with you. And that's where you, in the first instance, upload your stuff, your work. So it's independent of uh, any uh, Google Drive that you might receive from the GAUD office. While it is a Pratt-owned account, it is one that's specific and only to this seminar. <coughs> which gives us the opportunity to operate with it more freely. I can share with you more freely resources that may or may not be officially published because it's a class internal drive. And you can upload your work without being worried that it's not super finely polished and needs to be published or something like that. Okay, so the syllabus... I don't want to read through it now, and I welcome you to read through it. You'll find that in the drive that I'm sharing with you right now. Actually, let me pull that up to give you an overview. Um, okay, so here's the drive. The name of it is 21 SP24 Nanotectonica. And then this one is called class, meaning that's the folder for this class. Um, what the 21 stands for, it's kind of crazy. It's the 21st installment of this class. So that means theoretically that it's like, no, it can't be 20 years old. That's not possible. Um, maybe I have more than one a year at some point or something. But also during COVID, I did a really deep archive. I can show you on my screen. Um, these are this is the Nanotectonica archive, and you see here first installment was in uh, <clears throat> two thousand and seven, so really old. And this is actually that needs to be updated. I have not been updating it for the last three years. These are all the people that took the class. And sometimes they get in touch or whatever. So I want to put you there. Um, can I share this with Rachel to do that perhaps even? Um, let's see. Um, make sure to just add to it and don't take anything off this, please. Um, here we go. Okay. So this was just to say there is this folder that we're going to be using. And right now you find in this folder um, the syllabus that I was just mentioning. Um, and I just want to point out that it's basically two aspects of it in terms of what <clears throat> the requirements are. One is to do a little bit of a historical so, and this is a very brief thing. This is not like a PhD thesis or anything like that, but it's something that you might, it might help you to actually define a little bit your research interest. And the second one, B, is research production. Okay. Every next session, we can also have a break at the, whatever, at 11 or something, if this is a little bit too long. Today, since I'm only talking mostly, <clears throat> you might not mind so much. Um, so I just go sort of make best use of our time today. Okay, so that's the syllabus. And um, if you go through the, the different weeks, you'll see sort of a general rhythm of these historical reports, <clears throat> critiques and descripts and lectures and lab visits and um, the bibliography um, I underlined texts that I think you definitely should read 
Um, and if any of the texts aren't already in that folder, I will put them there so that you don't have to buy any books or whatever, scan anything from the library. All these texts I should be able to make available to you. The underlined ones are very few, actually. Um, so, a couple of more statements in terms of general statements is that, yes, we are indeed interested in the very small and in the very large. And we're also interested in the form building principles, not just how they look and that size matters. I just, I think have established and then it's all about design I have as well, that we are operating in a lineage, a long, long, long lineage of architects, designers, engineers, artists, naturalists uh, goes without saying. I think the look into nature um, for architects is as old as architecture itself. Um, the way we do it has changed and fundamentally so through our cosmologies and worldviews and definitions of the term nature. <clears throat> so again, there's the historical context and then there's the production part. And this production part is actually going through a set of phases that you'll be very familiar with soon that start with uh, image collection and then it starts restarts in two weeks with the, and then goes on with the organization of those SEM images. And then it goes to the actual production of original scanning electron microscopy material in the lab through the fine um, archiving and organization of these to the updating of organizational matrices and taxonomies to the analysis uh, at first through drawing of those uh, electron microscopy images to the development of um, to the development of um, geometric and tectonic um, building, uh, form building principles <clears throat> to the deployment of those principles outside of the context of the original reference in uh, whatever you define as your architectural context. So we're moving towards the historical grounds. Again, you see a few covers of relevant books here. And actually, I want to read, whenever you see this white page, it's a, it's a preview of the, the book that I'm working on for your benefit, because it's properly formulated. The ideas that I'm conveying verbally here, you can read up and revisit if you are interested. So I'm actually going to read from this one. It's pretty small, but if I put on the right glasses, maybe I can decipher it. Because I tried the impossible, which is to actually go through all of these historical references or authors in almost one sentence to define what they're all doing in a nutshell. Now, it's a little bit like a cartoon. You know, you can, in three words, define the oeuvre of a significant historical character, but just to point in the various directions. So I attempted to almost write it into one sentence. Okay, so bear with me. And you can read along if you can see that shared on your screen. Um, Nanotectonica conjoins theory and method of design. The research examines concepts of nature and models for design and discusses the problem of their relationship to technology and to each other. So to each other, meaning the concepts of nature and the concept of design are fundamentally intertwined um, but also the distinction of technology and culture, uh, perhaps distinctions that we want to overcome. Concepts and methods are critically discussed um, in the context of historical precedents and along a lineage of artists, scientists, and engineers who have pioneered ecological thinking and building. So here's the quick run through. This is my attempt to put them into one sentence, basically. Okay, so listen closely. <clears throat> Robert Hooke shaped the nascent field of modern science by building microscopes and visualizing the minute, minute bodies. That's part of a subtitle of his book. He observed in Micrographia. Ernst Haeckel, a very complicated figure and critical and problematic one, 
discovered species of the micro world, idealized his findings in illustrations and introduced the larger public to evolutionary theory as well as his own sinister version of Darwinism. I title that chapter Propaganda and Art Form, making a reference to his main work called Art Forms in Nature. <clears throat> René Binet translated Hackels, that's the previous guy, art forms to art nouveau architecture and decoration. Raoul Francais promoted the integration of biological processes with technology and laid ecological ground and periodicals on life in the micro world and in the soil, early ecology and biotechnique. The work of Hook, Heckel and Francais, so these three first three characters, raises the problem of representation as it relates to the dissemination of a particular view of nature. The aesthetic discussion, address, discuss, discussion addresses the detached decontextualized specimen drawings and the analytical autopsy drawings as models for architectural representation. I go on. Santiago Ramon y Callal, like Hook and Heckel, drew structures related to what he saw through the microscope, often in the form of analytical studies of synaptic connection whose functional implications led him to develop the neuron doctrine, drawing the nervous system. So this is a, a little bit of an outlier in that this is a somebody coming not exactly from the field of engineering, philosophy, or art, or science, but specifically medical field, and field, uh, then nascent field of neuroscience, uh, well, uh, um, um, Ramon, sorry, Ramon Kayal is also considered the father of modern neuroscience. Darcy Thompson's drawings of topological transformations promote physical laws as determinants of biological forms and structure, an alternative model to the natural selection of specimens developed on growth and form and structuralism. That's a, uh, always the reference to the main publication. <clears throat> Associating these models of representation in biology to drawing conventions in architecture, Kayal's work combines the functional diagram, the detailed section with Thompson uses the diagram as an operational drawings. Yogo Kepis reestablished re the relationship between scientific, in, scientific inter, inter, investigation and artistic expression on the cusps of the digital revolution by correlating scientific imaging with contemporary abstract art. That's in new landscapes of art and science by this author. Priado, and that's certainly a central character here that I'll be talking about a lot, devised open taxonomies for natural structures and included in his category procedurally optimized engineering systems. So in this category of natural structures, he included categories of optimized engineered structures, right? So procedurally optimized engineering systems a la Fry Auto are considered natural structures by Fry Auto and therefore a main contribution to our central question about nature and design. It became the basis for the geodesic dome and we're now talking about Buckminster Fuller and was later discovered resembled the molecular structure of the fullerene that is an actual case where the structure was first invented, if you will, by an architect slash engineer and then discovered in nature. So the scientists who discovered this particular uh, molecular structure named it after Buckminster Fuller because it resembled so directly an engineered geometric structure that he had conceived long before they discovered it in uh, imaging techniques. 
He related his studies on tension networks to Radilaria in order to understand the properties of skeletal structures. Robert Le Ricoulet, like Heckel, studied Radiolaria and like Fuller, was interested in the tensional integrity of such natural structures, which inspired his tensegrity models in space frame structures. So these are a couple of engineers we're talking about. Robert Le Ricoulet, Buckminster Fuller, Fry Otto. These are all engineers, or if we sometimes said MIT engineers with a heart, meaning that they're not the technocrats as engineers, but they're both uh, high experts at their field and also open thinkers that can include ideas both of design and even concepts coming from the humanities. Um, Angus Altin uh, related morphology and geometry, specifically <clears throat> the study of platonic form to human consciousness and wrote extensively on gender issues in architecture. So I wanna say one thing here in terms of the, the gender discussion, it is, I do feel it part of my obligation uh, to rectify something in the history of design that is the presence and importance um, of female protagonists. There aren't that many when you normally talk about any kind of scientific field. And in the design field, it's actually not that much different. And luckily that is uh, in the process of changing, um, but many female um, authors and researchers and designers and engineers have just not given the, been given the credit that they deserve. So for instance, in this case, uh, what many things that Ting did originally were credited to Louis Kahn, uh, one of the you know, master architects that she worked for. Um, we talked earlier about Charles and Raheem's is another example where for many decades, the male part of the partnership was always uh, in the foreground. So people, you know, would refer to, you know, Charles rather than Ray Eames or, you know, also in, in, the, in the case of um, learning from Las Vegas, we have another postmodern couple here. Um, uh, that, you know, exemplifies that in the partnership, I am myself in a partnership with a female architect. And it is fortunately so that nowadays that's not an issue anymore. If you do historical research though, you have to go the extra mile to actually identify the female contributions to all of these inventions because they're just not that well documented, unfortunately, until now. Um, that was, by, by the way, this was Denise Scott Brown um, who was, uh, instrumental author of Learning from Las Vegas and her male counterpart was for many decades the only name attached to this very important um, theoretical contribution to postmodern architecture. Um, and now we're kind of letting the pendulum swing back a little bit, maybe foreground the, the female partners for a couple of years until we <clears throat> enter a kind of a more balanced and equitable uh, distribution of credits here. Um, continuing with a couple of dudes again, um, coming from very much the scientific computer science world, that is, Christopher Langton, I mentioned, defined ar ar artificial life as a life as it could be and attempted to expand the field of bio biology beyond carbon based organisms to include human in initiated living system and synthetic nature, artificial life, AL, as I refer to it. Asterid Lindenmeyer falls in a similar sort of field, reviving string symbols to uh, emulate synthetic plant growth. Uh, Stephen Wolfram, you may be familiar with his Celela Automata, another kind of algorithmic uh, symbolic system that is pretty powerful. And um, we have uh, his big fat book, New Kinds of Science, exploring uh, further many of the ideas that Christopher Langton has originally laid out. And then uh, Mandelbrot, who developed the fractile geometry or the geometry of roughness, uh, another very important figure 
in the world of computation and geometry and sort of non-linear mathematical models to uh, comprehend and discuss um, complex systems. <clears throat> so here you see a list of all of those. So the first three parag paragraphs are very distinct authors um, that you can choose to study. These are the historical grounds. And then at the bottom where it starts with zero, zero, there are larger fields of more theoretical exploration. So you can th think about it in the, the structure of the seminar allows you to fall back into a very sort of structured routine or to really explore a free and open universe. And in this sort of double track, I've, ex I've di discovered, I wanna say, or experienced over the many years that I've been doing this, that that is actually the most productive format for you guys to develop genuine design ideas and design research innovation. Um, I have explored a very tightly scripted seminar exclusively. I've explored a very open and free seminar. And this seems to be the very happy middle world where you always have structural orientation to where you are in this process. And you always have complete freedom to direct it in a new way, which has the benefit for those of you who have not necessarily established a particular research interest to actually find one in a fairly structured way, where I'm giving you exercises that are very easy to follow and not really rocket science at all. You can just do the assignments but the assignments point towards you to actually expanding the inquiry into something that's more specifically your own interest. But it doesn't matter at what point you engage with one or the other track. You'll always be safe and you'll always be stimulated to explore your own design interests and research interests. So the last ones are probably for those who are on the theoretical and the historical end of it, perhaps already a little bit of an interest or more of an orientation. If that's so, we can, you look at any of those seven or so double zero topics as really only launch directions. We can craft it much more specifically to your interests. Let's say you have already taken a philosophy class with Gorkhan or Sanford or Catherine or Manuel um, or any colleagues who teach those kind of courses and you've established a particular interest into a contemporary theoretical model or even a historical philosophical grounds, this is an opportunity for you to explore that further if you like. If there's nothing like that, you can just simply rely on one of those 15 topics at the top of this slide, if it shows up. Um, Here we go. It shows on my screen anyway. Um, if you are on the Zoom call, you should be able to see it constantly. It's just not projecting. Um, so now all these names you've heard before, because I just read them into this really very condensed modern text with no BS, just the, the core of everything, which is also kind of it certainly does not do justice to any of those herbs to touch up on, but it is for you to at once get a, just a, a minute little idea about what this could be about. And then if you find a first interest, it makes it easier for you to crystallize your research agenda, ultimately. Just look at this, these historical grounds as really just points of departure. I'm asking you to do a little report, not long, you know, 10, 20 minutes, whatever, little slideshow. <clears throat> and we can, before you do, discuss what your focus is. But this could be a star that you choose one of those characters or one of these more open topics. And um, that's, a, that's the beginning of this track A, the theoretical or historical grounds. How would you store your interest in more than one? I'm sorry? If you're interested in more than one. Yes. 
You can. Um, we try to distribute it, and I have an Excel sheet for that prepared on the Google Drive that you are invited to. By the way, don't share that Google Drive. That's just for the 11 of you. Um, where you just sign up for a topic for now, you can put your name uh, under one, two, or three topics. So that we're making sure that not everybody's covering the same thing. Um, and then when you're actually formatting your historical research, you can combine different characters into your own topic. There's no limit to the flexibility that I'm providing. I just want to make sure that everybody has a start, has a beginning, right? <clears throat> so, and like the report will be a quick be a biographical reference, even though we're not necessarily dwelling on the, the human um, let's say biography so much. What we're more interested in are the ideas of the characters. It can't hurt to give us an idea historically, what time are we talking about, you know, and where did that character perhaps absorb his primary uh, interests. Um, but mostly we're interested at the cross section or the relationship between technological development um, and cultural conceptual thought. And so on the one side, the art and the science that may be found within the oeuvre of one of those protagonists, but on the other side, also the cultural and if you will, philosophical milieu that they were operating in and the technological developments that were interacting with that cultural and uh, philosophical uh, context. So <clears throat> here they are. Um, maybe uh, one more second on this slide. You see on the bottom of the slide, basically disciplines. Um, N stands for naturalist, M stands for microscopist, E stands for engineer, S stands for scientist, A stands for artist, P stands for philosopher. <clears throat> and you see that many of them actually cover several of those disciplines. It's a little bit analogous to the brain map that I showed you earlier. Um, so if they're here, I go through them super fast now because we only actually have a few more minutes left. Um, and I try to stick to our exact time frame. So I do this in a rapid drive-by and we can repeat it next time, but just to give you an overview. Okay, so the same sentences that I was reading before, okay? Bear with me. Robert Hooke. Do you guys remember Robert Hooke? I was describing what he did. Anybody remember what he did? Micrographia, that word? That rings a bell? Yeah, so what did he do? It's not like a pop quiz. I'm just curious. If that... So, yes, he was the first one to publish images from a microscope. Back then it was a regular microscope, like an optical microscope. He actually made the lenses. Yeah. And the, he not only made lenses for microscope, he also made lenses for telescopes. And he invented this really curious microscope where there was a little candle that would illuminate the specimen so you could see better. It's kind of funny. I show you a couple of pictures. Um, this is my official text. By the way, here's another thing that I want you to look up. Another link. Um, let's see. Nanotectonica on ISU. ISU? How do you call it? Okay, so there's the whole book, but it's a really big book. So they might not even let you uh, see the whole thing if you're not logged in as me, but only chapters. Um, so this link, we definitely wanna all have. I'm gonna throw it on here for now. Um, and then if you scroll down, so if you go to uh, Google Nanotectonica, you'll find it, or if you just go to ISU, I-S-S-U-U, you, you, 
there's non tectonica you'll find this and the individual chapters are here too so for the main 15 topics or maybe most of them at, at least you see a little one page summary which i want you to read because then you know what's already there so you can go beyond that in your report so we can pull up any of the guys that I was just talking about here. Uh, so Robert Hook, for instance, would be this one. And then you see a quick article and a lot of references uh, that might be useful. Um, okay, so this was issuu.com, my last name, and there you find this, okay? Mm. So if you were to read all of those here, you will basically get the exact overview I've been giving you today. Hmm. Go back to the slideshow. I know we have only a few more minutes left. Um, keynote, here we go. Um, okay, so that's Robert Hooke. This is, by the way, the, tele the microscope I was talking about just now. Um, okay, so Ernst Heckel, you might remember from the seminar in fall, by the way, when you were when you were in my class in uh, what is design. Um, uh, one of our colleagues, um, I think it was Artemis, was talking about um, Ernst Haeckel. And I was holding back a little bit in that class to discuss Ernst Haeckel because he's such a prominent character in this class. And I didn't want to hijack the philosophical discussion when, that we had. But it's important to be able to also discuss figures that are problematic, right? It's almost like, is it okay to watch a Woody Allen movie? You know what I mean? Um, in other words, that there may be part of an author's work that is hugely problematic. And at the same time, there are actually contributions that are meaningful, right? But you need to be discussing these things critically. Right? So a lot of artists, a lot of architects over the last hundred years have looked into this beautiful work, work of Ernst Haeckel, and you guys are familiar with these visuals and remain just at the sort of the aesthetic bamboozling of the visual powers, but not critically discussing the actual work of Ernst Haeckel, <clears throat> which the reason why I'm calling it propaganda and art form is that his art forms and nature publications were coffee, coffee table books 120 years ago. Everybody who thought of themselves as educated middle-class or bourgeoisie they had that book on their coffee table. I know something about science. I know something about nature. I know something about art, that kind of a expression, right? When in fact, he also promoted a worldview that was laying ground to Nazi Germany by disseminating a particular kind of social Darwinism, which is highly problematic. And at this point, I would say that that's an agreed upon perspective um, that he actually was knowingly and willingly contributing to a worldview that actually allowed for the destruction and discrimination and destruction of groups of humans only a decade later under the emerging fascist regime. So I'm just putting this out there very crystal clear for you guys because I, for one, do not disconnect neither generally the discussion of nature from politics, but specifically one I'm convinced that we cannot separate our work from historical and political meanings. It's very important to me, actually, that we read a little bit below the surface of any of those architects, engineers, naturalists, obvious expressions and look for what they imply and actually perhaps sometimes even read what they're saying. Now architects usually, very, very few architects have meaningful stuff to be read. But when it comes to these naturalists, it's actually very meaningful to also see how they frame their work 
to making sure. This is an example of also how much of a charlatan he was. He insisted in this idea that in our individual evolution in the womb as an embryo, we actually relive the entire evolution of the species. And that it literally at month so-and-so in the womb, you look like a frog or a pig or whatever, right? So that kind of cartoonish idea of the correlation between the evolutionary history of the species and the evolutionary history of the individual exemplified here, you know, see like, you know, in week so-and-so you look like a swine, okay, right? And in week so-and-so you look like a frog. All of this was doctored. These are not actual visuals coming out of imaging the embryo, but they were stylizing this in the same way that he stylized the, the natural phenomena. Anyway, um, René Binet took his work and made it, put it into the world of architecture and decoration. Super interesting character. Uh, Raoul Francais, uh, godfather of bionics, if you will. Uh, soil geometry, uh, Raoul Cayal, I'm going really quickly now. I just mentioned uh, the neuroscience father, landscape and art and science, uh, Diogo Kepes at MIT, very much about the relationship between science and art, <clears throat> sorry, uh, visual techniques in science and visual techniques in art. Darcy Thompson, early proponent of Darwinism in a structuralist perspective, growth and form, our idea of topology very much based on the work of Darwin, of Darcy Thompson rather. Um, natural models of Fry Otto, I'll talk about him very long. Many of the research topics you can choose hinge around his work, which is at the same time uh, he's famous for these really beautiful large-scale built structures of Olympic Stadium and other sports arenas. But also, and perhaps more importantly for us, uh, there's two other directions. One is the um, scientific research he conducted on natural structures, including the structure categorization systems, and also the performative models that uh, Fry Otto is very famous for. We see here a uh, couple of images of his cosmology when it comes to structural categories and the very kind of precise discussion. I, I wrote a quick short piece. You can pull that up on the ISO page as well. Um, so that's all Fry Otto and his institutes in Stuttgart with natural structures in this particular case, actually looking into SEM and dome structures, um, infrastructure system, tree branching system, threat models. All of this stuff is super interesting in the work of Fry Otto. Um, Buckminster Fuller, we mentioned, is very well known for many reasons, also politically very active. active. At the 68 times, if you connect anything with that date, the student uh, upheaval in the late 1960s in the West, in North America and in Europe. He was already, uh, you know, grown man and professor, but he was very much part of that student movement at that time. So very much an engineer, very much a free thinker, but also politically uh, active character. Robert Laricolet with these absolutely otherworldly integrity structures. If you choose this topic, you know that you will be covering new territory because very little of his work is actually published. You have to really look deep into finding stuff. A lot of it is in a dusted attic at Penn, all these models he built with the students. Uh, like uh, Buckminster Fuller and Fry Otto actually, Specifically for our auto, uh, Robert Le Ricolet, French, or originally French, um, has an early history in uh, World War II, um, then moved into the field of engineering. And he is also considered a father of the space frame. We talked about Angres World Ting before and her work and how, is it, how it is now starting to be remembered as genuinely her own work. Here you see the Ting toy uh, and herself on the right side when she was a younger woman and designer. Artificial life, I mentioned Christopher Langton, beautiful stuff to define principal terms. 
synthetic plants with uh, the Lindenmeyer oil systems, Stephen Wolframs, uh, Cellular Automata and Benoit Mandelbrot's uh, fractals. And then we have these uh, general topics um, that have to do with um, theoretical contemporary thought. <clears throat> so these are all on an Excel sheet and all I'm asking you to do on this end by next week is just plug in your name in this Excel sheet. Maybe I should pull it up. Um, huh? You should, yeah, you should have access. Yes, this is this call. It's called historical topics. Yeah. Okay, so you can just put your name there. And if you are, if this is taken, you can still put your name there, right? You can repeat another's. Don't worry about anybody else. Just put your first three, uh, put your name next to the, whatever you're interested in. And then we'll sort it out. Hmm? You don't worry about anybody else. Just put for your own self, pick the three topics, start with, or maybe one. If there's only one you're interested, put one. Okay, so by next week, we'll probably have a better idea about this stuff. Um, I'm going to conclude really quickly. Um, this is that book, by the way, flipping through it. Um, which perhaps you can support a little bit too, we'll see. Um, okay, just quickly to the media stuff. Um, I, for one, am very much, I work inclusive with media. I like to embrace all kinds of media and technology. That doesn't mean you have to, just to be clear, if I'm engaging in social media and you don't want to, you don't have to, right? It goes as far as if you don't ever want to be tagged or you never want any of your own stuff to be online, just tell me and that will be fully respected. If you are more open with these things like I am, go for it, you know, do me a favor, put the hashtag nanotectonica on everything so we find it. It's really always nice to get an alert that something from the seminar has been shared with the world. If you just put the hashtag nanotectonica, I will find it, we will find it, and it is another form of communication that way. Um, most importantly, you have access now to this Google Drive. This will be our main platform for now. If we have another platform like Slack or Thread, we will let you know, but as of now, the only thing you need is that one link to the Google Drive. Okay, um, so the first exercise is very simple. On the track A, you just put your name next to the topics that you like on that Excel sheet. On the track B, we're starting with an image collection. <clears throat> now that's super casual. And just to be fun, you can almost switch off your cerebral brain when you're doing it. It's just to be fun and visual stuff. Basically, you're collecting scanning electron microscopy images. Technically, they're all black and white. Now, here's a trick question. Why do you think they're black and white? Because there's no light involved, right? For color, you need light. But the electrons that are jumping off the specimen, they're either there or not. They're not on a color scheme. So they're interpreted in grayscales. Anyway, so um, very playfully, Trust your instincts. You've been here for two and a half years and you've been training your design eye for many more, I'm sure. So you can trust that you have an intuition to collect some really cool stuff. And there's no source that's off limit. They may be biological material, but they actually don't have to be. Um, they can be minerals, they can be you know, crystals, but they can also be life, either plants, animals, or fungi, living systems. I would probably stay away from man-made stuff and engineered stuff, even though if you're really, really super interested in that, you can do that too. Um, 
and they reveal some kind of a structure. There are all kinds of different structures. Structures don't necessarily look like hierarchical lattices or pattern formations, but that's what we're interested in, right? These may be patterns and they may be tectonic principles, but that's sort of what we're trying to sort out from them. So really just, I just encourage you to just collect a ton of them. And that can be easily done via image search or going to the library. And then you can loosely sort them in different groupings. You can play around with it, that's all. Okay, I'll you know follow up with this. Uh, I'll definitely also upload this uh, recording and then I will remind you of this mini little finger exercise, but make sure it's fun, okay? So no cerebral mind, no work ethic, or so just like, have fun, enjoy it. Try to let your aesthetic juices flow when you see these images, right? Whatever you see in them. And there's no wrong. There's only right ways of doing this. Okay. Um, I think that's it for now. Are there any questions at all? No? Okay, well, it's been a pleasure meeting you all. And I'm going to close this session now, the Zoom call that is. Bye bye, Celine in Istanbul. Bye, Jonas. Thank you. Take care. See you next week. <laughs>